Good morning, my name is Edwin Peabody and this is volume 84 of I'm Safe in the Coronavirus. And today, as uh, requested, we're going to be reading from Man with the Banjo, written by George Robert, about the life of my grandfather, Eddie Peabody, prior to World War II. We're going to start on chapter 3, as requested. New York City, the talk of the town, Rudy Valley. His banjo gets hot and smokes, reported the New York Times. Rudy Valley folded the paper and turned to his producer. Jack, get us a couple of tickets to the Brooklyn Fox Theater tonight. I want to get a, a good look at this banjo man, Eddie Peabody. The press seems to think that this guy is a hot act, and we could sure use a fill-in for next Thursday's radio show. I'll be at the club most of the day, but I'll call you about noon, all right? Rudy Valley was the image of Ivy League sophistication. A six-foot, wavy-haired, dashing crooner with a megaphone, he was the idol of many vaudevillian performer, performers and hopefuls. His New York syndicated radio show was nationally known and boasted a listening audience of more than 100 million. He held court and often gave press interviews at his spacious and elegantly furnished apartment near Central Park. Jack Turner, Rudy's High Ho Club producer, secretary, schedule keeper, and overall personal assistant was a short, overweight, nervous man that never stood still. But he loved the view of the park from Rudy's balcony. And though he was listening as Rudy barked orders from an overstuffed lounge chair, he caught himself starting to drift as he took in all the activity around the pond. He jerked abruptly as he turned to answer his boss. Will do, Rudy, and you're right. They say this guy's like lightning. Maybe he could give that German guy in the band, you know, what's his name, Heinz, I think his name is, a few tips. No, now that I think about it, if this banjo man sat in, who knows what Heinz would do. Now, we've got to fire that guy, Rudy. Send him back to Germany. He's an accident waiting to happen. Anyway, I've heard this banjo wizard Peabody can really dazzle him, Rudy. Maybe he could give you a few tips. All right, all right, all right. Now, knock it off, knock it off. I bet he can't sing or play the sax, and I'm sure he can't excite the ladies with your time is my time. Rudy grinned as he crooned a few bars of his transna transnational hit. I'll call you in a couple of hours. Do what you have to regarding the German fellow. And make sure the Brooklyn Paramount has my stage settings for the guest appearance on Saturday. You got it, boss. Jack connected with the Fox Theater manager and reserved four seats, two rows back from the orchestra. Rudy, Jack, Rudy's program manager, and one of the WEAF radio station secretaries, whom Jack had been dating, all arrived separately, but within minutes of curtain call. As the orchestra was warming up, Jack leaned over the secretary and copped a quick feel while he whispered to Rudy, Looks like the fox tries to run things on time. The lights dimmed. The orchestra opened with classic 1812 overture kettle drums and cymbals, and once again... Little Eddie came sliding down the neck of a large wooden banjo stage prop, landing with a bang, and immediately he warmed up his fingers to the poet and peasant overture. The little guy in starched white sailor trousers and a short red jacket was one awe-inspiring bundle of energy. He bounced around on a tiny stool and delivered as many crisp musical notes as a concert pianist. His enthusiasm bubbled over when he smiled. Everyone knew this guy loved performing for them. Some in the audience held their breath as they marveled at his fingers dancing up and down the instrument. The applause after each number was thunderous. When Eddie, when Eddie finished his segment of the show, Rudy stood from his seat. Did you watch the guy's hands? I've never seen anything that fast. Let's get backstage and see if we can get him for a, uh, a guest spot. Eddie! Jack was yelling over the cacophony of the performers and stagehands. Eddie headed toward his dressing room, carrying his banjo like a rifle, with the neck resting on his shoulder. Rudy touched Jack's arms. Jack, look at that bright, happy-faced smile, his touch, the enthusiasm, and the warm and friendly greetings from everyone in the show. It's infectious! Eddie, Eddie, excuse us, please. Jack extended his hand. Jack Turner here. Could we have just a minute of your time? You know Rudy here, I'm sure. 
Rudy had that well-known effervescent smile of his beaming at Eddie as he gingerly shook the man's hand while resting his other hand on Eddie's shoulder. No one in North America, let alone show business, could ever mistake Rudy Valley. Eddie, Jack and I just caught your show, and we, were, we thought you were sensational. There was deep sincerity in Rudy's voice. Well, thank you, good man. Coming from you, that is a compliment indeed. Let's move to my dressing room, away from the crowd here, shall we? At least we should be able to hear ourselves thinking there. Though the man was not long-legged, both Rudy and Jack had to hustle to keep up with the little sandy-haired ex-sailor. Once the door closed, Rudy began to slowly pace in circles. The room was small, too small for Rudy's nervous pacing. Eddie, I'll come right to the point. I want you on my radio show. You'll have my listeners dancing in the streets. Now, I've got Kate Smith booked for a guest spot this week, but how about you and I doing a duet or something with a short interview the week after? Rudy's antics were so distracting and comical that all Eddie could manage was a burp and a grunt. Rudy now stood in the middle of the room with his hands folded behind his back. He looked at Eddie with a facial expression that clearly communicated, What the hell are you doing? Have you heard anything I've said for the past five minutes? Eddie broke the short silence and motioned for Rudy and Jack to take a seat on the small couch, crammed against one wall under a large framed mirror. Rudy, you're a very persuasive man. I'll do your guest spot. Chapter 4. Rudy's Via Valley. The Via Valley Club was the swankiest nightclub in all New York City. With its marble floors, crystal-encased lighting, and mirrored wall panels, the place looked like it came directly from the palace in Versailles. And the nightly clientele represented the city's upper crust. Senators, congressmen, state legislators, judges, police chiefs, and anyone else in the political spotlight not wanting to be seen frequenting a nightclub. Rudy warmly greeted his new friend. He placed his hand behind Eddie's elbow as if to guide him. Come on back to the office for a minute, would you? I've got something I need to talk to you about, and maybe you can show me some more of your, uh... Rudy was suddenly distracted. Well, good evening, Your Honor, Rudy beamed. Glad to see you could join us this evening. Mayor, may I introduce you to Eddie Peabody? Eddie's going to help us celebrate tonight. And this is, uh... Rudy turned to greet the absolutely stunning young lady accompanying the mayor. She blushed and was absolutely shell-shocked when the nationally famous heartthrob Rudy Valley leaned over and kissed her hand. Your name, sweetheart? She blinked, shook her head, and breathed heavily. Emma. After a brief moment of silence, she erupted into a woodpecker-like laugh that had everyone within the earshot turning to see what the commotion was. The mayor and two rather husky gentlemen quickly hustled the young lady into the adjoining dining room. With a Cheshire crat cat grin, Rudy turned back to Eddie and rolled his eyes. Ah, yes, the essence of beauty with a voice like a bird. Let's head through the kitchen and up to my private office. Heidi ho Rudy's office was more extravagant than anything Eddie had ever seen. A large, polished wood desk was the centerpiece, with luxurious leather chairs angled at the front for visiting guests. A leather couch with a coffee table sat against one wall, facing a floor-to-ceiling bookcase along the opposite wall. A draperied window covered the wall behind Rudy's desk. Rudy manipulated two handles attached to the bookcase, revealing a hidden private bar. The glassware behind the case was crystal, glittering like polished diamonds. The labeled decanters contained nothing but the best. Blended Canadian whiskies, Cuban rum, and Russian vodka. Pretty swanky, McGee, Eddie quipped as his eyes tried to take it all in. What do you have, my good friend? Rudy took out two tumblers and threw in some chipped ice from a small container nearby. All I've got is Canadian whiskey, rum, and vodka, but if I may recommend the Canadian, it is simply superb. Now, what's your pleasure? The Canadian would be fine, Rudy. Damn it, man, you have a, quite a setup here. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. If Maud saw this, she'd... Rudy was quick with, where'd you say your wife was off to? He handed Eddie a drink and directed him over to the leather couch. She's in Texas, thank God, visiting her folks. Her father is uh, not well. 
She's a fine business manager, my friend, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I was happy having her out of my hair for a couple of weeks. Eddie, I need your help, good friend. Just name it. Oh, damn. This is the smoothest I believe I've ever tasted. Boy, oh boy, I bet you don't share this with the poor people. Rudy laughed, loosened his collar, and began to relax. Well, my friend, I've been trying to find a rhythm banjo player for the club band for more than a week now. <laughs> Jack hired some German fellow, and he has been nothing short of a disaster. Not only was the SOB a lush, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. On top of that, he's tried to pick a fight with damn near everyone in the band. Really? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I usually bump into several banjo players after the Sunday matinee. I'll put the word out and see if anyone is interested. Thank you, my friend. Anything you can come up with would be a blessing. Would you believe he nearly started a fight on stage with that hot jazz violinist I'd hired last week just because the guy was French? This guy was German, of course, but I can't remember his name. I think it was Blintz, Mintz, or, or maybe Heinz. I'm glad we fired that hothead anyway. I truly am sorry. Your club band has a great reputation. I'll ask around and see what I can turn up for you, pal. Thanks. Oh, and there's one other thing I'd like to twist your arm on. Rudy's eyes lit up, and he moved to the edge of his seat. I'm hosting a private party tonight in one of the adjoining ballrooms. Actually, entertaining a, fa a few special patrons. I'd like you and your banjo to help me out if you're game. It should be a barrel of laughs. What do you say? Eddie understood the part about Rudy wanting him to help entertain some influential folks, but he was silently waiting for the other shoe to drop. The man was acting like he just stole a pig. The affair is going to be wide open, my fine feathered friend. Sort of no holds barred, if you know what I mean. You know, and any raids tonight, and, and the state of New York will have to elect a whole new state legislator, and maybe a few from the Supreme Court as well. <laughs> Eddie stood up and touched his glass to Rudy's with an audible clink. Terrific! So let's get down there and see how this uh, bacchanalia is progressing, uh, shall we? They both refreshed their drinks. And wait till you see this chorus girl Jack is lined up tonight. And wouldn't you know the floor plan of this marvelous building requires that we travel through their dressing room to get to the ballroom. <laughs> Rudy was smiling broadly and swirled his index finger in the air, as if ready for the fox hunt to begin. Eddie gave out with a chuckle, feeling giddy and lightheaded. He wasn't sure, but it felt like he and his friend were about to do something quite naughty. Well, hidey-ho, I say, and let's go.